Welcome to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki. The latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Here's co-host Bob Bennis. Broadcasting from the studios in the Cousins Center, the hub of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, overlooking beautiful Lake Michigan. Good morning and welcome to Living Our Faith here on Relevant Radio. Let's introduce the host of the show, His Excellency Archbishop Jerome Listecki. Good morning. Good morning, Bob. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Help, help me out, though, because I'm not real fluent on my Latin. We want to talk about Amoris the joy. Letizia. Letizia? Yeah. Letizia. Yeah. Right. What right. we're, we're going to talk about today is the joy of love the book that came out back in the middle of April uh, by Pope uh, Francis. And we have two wonderful guests here with us today. We have Sarah Larson. Sarah is a parishioner up at Saints Peter and Paul on Milwaukee's east side. And we've also got Will Hudson. Will is a parishioner up at St. Peter's in Slinger. And what we do, we'll go ladies first. We, we always want the audience to learn a little bit more about you. So tell us about your faith life, where you're from, growing up, all those things that are tied to the faith life. And Sarah, if you would, please. Sure. Thank you so much. I grew up in Rockford, Illinois, and I grew up in a Catholic family. I was really involved in parish life and church life growing up, and I loved that. But it wasn't until I was a student at Marquette University that I really fell in love with Jesus and with the Catholic Church. And I kind of happened into a really amazing community of Catholics there who were very welcoming and encouraging and faithful. And it was during my time at Marquette that I really came into my faith, I would say. My husband, Mike, and I are high school sweethearts. So we wow. got married while we were in college. Mm -hmm. And my first son, Sam, was born seven days after I graduated from Marquette. I spent the next stage of my life as a stay-at-home mom with my son, Sam, and then my son, Benjamin, three years later. As I ended up um, at the end of that time, I was able to take on a part-time job at our parish, Saints Peter and Paul, and work in family ministry. I started off at four hours a week, so just a very small part-time job, and that has grown over the last six years, both in time and in parishes. Now I'm the director of family ministry for four parishes, Saints Peter and Paul, Our Lady of Divine Providence, Old St. Mary's, and Three Holy Women. Wow. And so I'm kind of taking off on this new adventure with those four parishes and a family ministry team working together there. You've got that wonderful Father Tim Kitsky. Kitsky. Kind of yep. With. Yeah, wow, I get to work with good, Father Tim right. all the time. It's great. Yes. He's a little human dynamo, isn't he? Yes, yes. Yeah, Exciting it. things are happening. Yeah, they, they certainly are. Exciting things are always happening around Father Kitty. <laughs> yes. That's for sure. Will, tell us your story, if you would, please. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so actually, I'm new to the area. I just moved here last June. I grew up in Kansas. Um, the name of the town is actually Pittsburgh, Kansas, believe it or not. Um, but I grew up in Kansas, went uh, to Catholic school my whole life. Uh, my family was Catholic, went to Sunday Mass, and I maybe uh, experience similar to Sarah, but just slowly but surely uh, started taking my faith a little bit more seriously. I'd say in high school, there was a number of conversion moments that I guess allowed me to, to, to mature in my faith and to realize that, to, I guess to fall in love with the Lord, really, honestly and truly. Uh, and then I went to Benedictine College, which is also in Kansas, and that was uh, uh, just an amazing experience in my formation um, and in my life. I loved it there. Um, the community was strong. It was just a, an intentional Catholic community. That's where I met my wife. So I met her freshman year there. And we were actually, um, so my wife, Jenna, we, we were just married last August. So new well, married. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And we're expecting our first child just in a, in a couple of weeks wow. here. So, Great. yeah, so pretty exciting. And so the, after, after Benedict and I went to Boston College for further studies and then got married, came to Milwaukee, and then here I am. So now I work in the, the vocation office with Father Luke, Father Luke Strand, so helping him out. So it's been a joy. Another dynamo. I you know. know. He's, he's wonderful. Well, he's so. Working, working, working. I know. I'm trying to keep up with them. Good, so, good. Yeah. You, you mentioned providential moments that brought you closer to the faith. Sure. Can you touch on one or two of them? Yeah. My freshman year, actually, a junior in high school invited me to come to a, a men's rosary group, just a high school. We just get together once a week, say the rosary, and then share a meal together and hang out. And my freshman year, he invited me. And at that point, like, I had gone to Sunday Mass, but my faith was just, I don't know, it's, it's not cool when you're in middle school and high school. <laughs> and so it, it kind of took me aback, but it caused me to think more about, you know, do I want to take my faith seriously? Is this something important to me? And so, like, eventually saying yes to that invitation started a chain of reactions. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, wonderful. Now, and we're talking a little bit of the joy of love. Absolutely. And I and I uh, use the possessive for you, Letizia. It's Letizia. Letizia. So, yeah, so the possessive is A-E. 
they um, uh, this is a singular a. So, a, in, in in taking a look at the joy uh, the the joy of love, what what struck you both about Pope Francis's you know, presentation, marriage? For me, the first thing I saw it through a ministry mindset, but first of all, I was just really struck by the challenge to be personally. It made me want to be a better wife and a better better mother. Yeah. Um, because he holds out this amazing vision of what marriage is and what family is. And I'm aware of it. And I also am aware of how I fall short of that. So just reading it really inspired me to want to be better and want to recommit to those things. How about you, uh, Will? General impression. Sure. I, I loved it. I felt like he just had such practical insights and he just really understood the nature of love and grave, uh, gave a lot of I don't know, key insights and just like Sarah said, how I could be a better husband, a better listener, just a better lover altogether. I, I just really loved his tone. Yeah. As an archbishop as a, and as a celibate, you know, I, I step back and uh, for me, what w- was really important was the fact that he's asking, for, in my mind, he's asking uh, couples to s- step back and consider what they're involved in. You know, when you're involved in an action, you don't always realize the, the significance of what you're what you're doing you know i mean it's true for for priests it's true for any of us in any vocation which we, we're just doing we're doing but then all of a sudden you, you step back and you have those moments when you look and you go wow mm-hmm. this is this is really significant this, i'm really blessed you know by having this um, man or this woman in in my life uh sharing my life and having these children and understanding i'm shaping lives we don't we don't live on that intense level of right. scrutiny at a, every moment. But we have to take the time to s- step back so that we understand, we appreciate, and we mm-hmm. embrace what we're doing. And, and for me, in his first five chapters, that's basically what he what he did. Yeah, absolutely. And he, he multiple times said he, he encourages the couples to realize they're, they're a part of something that's bigger than themselves. Mm-hmm. And they're a part of a lifelong journey, a lifelong project um, of growing in love gradually. And I, yeah. It was just very encouraging for me as a newly married man. In the very beginning of the book, he says every family should look to the icon of the Holy Family mm-hmm. of Nazareth. Yeah. And later on, he talks about don't see your, your sons as boys as much as see, see all sons and daughters as children. Mm-hmm. They're all, see them as children first. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it it's fantastic. Yeah, it was it was it, it was interesting that off of the synod in in the document which was anticipated that individuals immediately thought it would be a very contentious type of document, you know, or that people would be fighting or jacking for positions or be fighting to be able to to get their point of view in or um, or help to kind of reshape basically the thing in terms of uh, of marriage. And yet, you know, in, in reading, it's very traditional. It's you right. know, it's a, it, it's really the church's doctrine is is basically right there. And he, and the Pope exhorts individuals to slowly read the, the word, mm-hmm. not just boom, read through it and kind of push it on the side and and capture it, but slowly re- read the work. Do you, do you get the same sense, sir? Yes, and I think he's he's very intentional about trying to strike that balance of being really challenging, but also offering mercy. And I think that's really beautiful, and it's something you really have to kind of dig into and sit with, because if you just try to take little sections by themselves, you might not find that balance. But when you read it as a whole, you see that he is always... Off calling people to something greater than themselves while also being very compassionate to the fact that we don't always live up to that ideal. And I thought that was really beautiful and encouraging. Yeah, I, I feel like I had the same experience too, reading the entire thing as a whole and not taking anything out of context. It just, it reaffirms like the beauty of marriage, the beauty of love, the beauty of the church's teaching, but also um, at key points trying to, to challenge us, to be merciful, to it, accompany it, people. As you listen to the, the, the critics of the Hope's presentation, it's something that you said, uh, Will, immediately. They're going to take what they want mm-hmm. out of context sure. and, and try to either em- embrace that or challenge that. And the work is ac- actually meant, as all works are, as a whole. Right. You know, not, not not to be dissected and then therefore pulled out, but mm-hmm. but basically as a whole. Um, in, in his first chapters, definitely dedicated to understanding uh, marriage and family life. 
definitely. Right, and he does so quite beautifully, too. In particular, I think of chapter 4. He, he, he goes through St. Paul, the first letter of Corinthians, chapter 13, mm-hmm. the hymn to love. And I just, yeah, it was really beautiful. And also, like, he just gives very, like, grandfatherly advice about the nature of love and love is patient and, and what that means and what how that can apply to, to your own life. I, I just thought it was beautiful. And he gets how hard it is to live that out. You right. actually sense yeah. that as you <laughs> as you read this. He understands that we're not perfect and that all of this beautiful vision is something that we all have to work for every day. And I, I love that he really recognizes that reality. Right. And you reference chapter 4, Will, sure. which is titled Love and Marriage. Mm-hmm. And quoting our Holy Father, he says, If we accept that God's love is unconditional, that the Father's love cannot be bought or sold, then we will become capable of showing boundless love and forgiving of others even when they have wronged us. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it ties right in with the, basically his, his whole theme and his understanding of mercy. Mm-hmm. If you begin by understanding mercy has been extended to you and you don't deserve you know, the mercy. Uh, you, you, you're receiving it freely. And as someone who has been the recipient of mercy, then you're called, therefore, to take that mercy which you've received and basically share it with others. And we wrong the giver of mercy, ultimate mm-hmm. giver of mercy, God, when we don't extend in basically that same manner his mercy to others. What, uh, what's, what's really wonderful in this work is, as you were talking about the first four chapters establishing the, the underpinning, the basis of marriage, tell me something, what in, in your life resonated immediate what example kind of resonated immediately with uh, with the, the work one one thing he says um over and over again throughout the entire work but even in the first four chapters he he, he calls marriage a lifelong project and also he says he says no no like a perfect family doesn't just fall from heaven so like no perfect family falls from heaven and that was that really struck with me it was encouraging to say you know like my wife and i are on a journey and Mm -hmm. yeah we're we're on a pretty fresh journey actually but yeah and we're on a journey and it takes time and patience and growth and trials um so that that image of a lifelong project and a journey that, that really set sat with me and struck me. And you're going to have an aha experience. Yeah, I know. As soon you as know. we have our baby, yeah, everything's going aha. to be different. <laughs> you know. We're talking with Will Hudson and Sarah Larson this morning on Living Our Faith. We're going to take our first break, and you'll also get to hear the news from our friends over at the Catholic Herald. You're listening to Living Our Faith here on Relevant Radio for Southeast Wisconsin. Many of us at some point in our lives must face a decision regarding how we can best be cared for when rehabilitation is necessary following surgery or medical crisis. Hear from St. Camillus Nursing Administrator Sandra Dugan regarding the exceptional rehabilitation program at St. Camillus. What makes St. Camillus Rehab unique and special as it compares to our competitors is that we are the only continuum of care campus in the area that offers skilled nursing, home health, and outpatient services. You will get consistent staff throughout your rehab journey, and there's excellent communication throughout the continuum in order to promote maximum outcomes. They also can continue with the home care therapists that they have already come to know and trust in their own home when they're discharged from our facility. For more information regarding St. Camillus Rehabilitation, go to relevantradio.com keyword rehab. That's keyword rehab. Good morning. I'm Grace David with highlights from this week's Catholic Herald and CatholicHerald.org. It is a blessing when a member of a family is ordained a priest. Imagine then how blessed Bernadette and Jerry Strand of St. Bruno Dousman are. They have three sons who are priests, after Father Vincent Strand was ordained a Jesuit last Saturday at Jesu. His brothers, Father Luke and Father Jacob, are priests of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Read about the Strand family and how it has been a fertile area for fostering vocations to the priesthood in this week's Catholic Herald and at catholicherald.org. Speaking of vocations, Dave and Dawn Kinsman have been living theirs for nearly 30 years. He is coordinator of ministries for the Newman Center at UWM, and she is the center's administrative assistant. But these are not jobs. These are callings. Callings that have them ministering to young adults who are at critical points in their faith journeys. Read how the kinsmen's minister and what impact their ministry has had on those they serve in this week's Catholic Herald and at catholicherald.org. You may relate to this headline, Put Down the Phone and Open Door to Civility. 
That's the advice Father Jan Kator shares with readers in this week's Catholic Herald. Father Cotter writes, Cell phone obsession has become a serious epidemic and one that threatens our spiritual well-being. He goes so far as to call texting while driving a sin. We have always been taught not to put ourselves in the occasion of sin. To do so makes us vulnerable to possible disaster. Some may question my use of the word sin in this context, but all sin involves actions that are displeasing to God, he writes. After you read Father Cotter's thoughts, clip it and share it with those who need to read his words. Our final story is about us, the Catholic Herald itself. Last Friday, the Catholic Herald was honored by the Catholic Press Association with three first-place awards for its writing, an editorial, a personality profile, and analysis and reporting on a local issue. This week's Catholic Herald and CatholicHerald.org have all the details. Summer is almost here, but faith doesn't take a vacation. Read updates of Catholic news and information at CatholicHerald.org so you'll always be current on what is happening in the Catholic Church. This is Grace David. Have a great weekend. We now return you to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Lestecki. We're talking about Pope Francis' book, The Joy of Love. It's highly recommended. It's on everybody's list in this room. Our guest today, Sarah Larson. Sarah is the Director of Family Ministry for Old St. Mary's, Our Lady of Divine Providence, Three Holy Women in Saints Peter and Paul Parishes, as well as Will Hudson. Will is the Associate Director of Vocations and Formation at St. Peter's in Slinger. Archbishop? And Sarah, I, I, I saw you shaking your head when Will was um, uh, expressing uh, basically how the... Um, um, how the work affected him in terms of his the specificity of his marriage. How about yourself, Sarah? Well, I think that because of the stage of family life I'm at, um, my husband and I have been married almost 15 years, and our sons are 13 and 10. It's a really, really busy time with work and kids' activities and all of that. And he talks a lot of times about the busyness of life. And there's this beautiful part where he says, even so, he talks about how busy we all are, and then he says, <laughs> even so, the family still needs to be this place where we encounter God and learn to love each other. And for me, that's really was really challenging because it's easy, I think, for all of us busy families to make excuses. We're just busy. Yes, we're yeah. too busy for that, for family prayer, to get to Mass on the weekend, whatever. And so for me to hear him say, I hear how busy you are. But yeah. even so, yeah. this is what you're called to be. This is your priority. And so we're always kind of working to prioritize the things that really matter in spite of the fact that life can get really busy. As an excuse, it's not good enough. Yes. It, it's just, it's not, it, because you're involved in something which is so important um, and, and you can't allow yourself for your own good, for the sake of your own good, for the sake of your marriage, for the sake of your family. You can't allow yourself uh, to use that as an excuse not to embrace that uh, that tremendous mis uh, mystery. Now, now you're involved, Sarah, with family ministry. How how are you going to take you know uh, um, Amoris Laetitia? How are you going to take that, and how are you going how are you going to incorporate it into what you do in terms of family ministries? Yeah, that's a good question. I've been thinking about it a lot because realistically, most people are not going to sit down and read this whole document themselves. So it's up to us who are working in the church to embrace it in our ministries and share it with people. And I think the thing that I am really taking from this, as well as a lot of what Pope Francis has been saying, is this idea of accompaniment. He uses that language over and over in this document and in other things that we in the church are called to walk with people and be close to people and accompany them through life. And so I've been, for a number of years, trying to shift my ministry focus to really trying to be close to people and walk with them, accompany them in life, because that's where real change happens. That's how real conversion happens. That's that's how you really help people in their everyday lives. And so, like I said, to really just spend time getting to know people and keep my focus on people more than programs. So do you build... A curriculum around this, or do you just weave elements in as you touch on uh, segments with these people, where chapters from this book would apply? How 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 do you how do you, more specifically how do you incorporate that then? Um, I think I would say that really the best way would be just 
incorporating this into my own life and ministry and family uh, and mm-hmm. then sharing that through personal witness because I think that means more to people than uh, exposition of here's what the Pope says about this. But when you share your own personal stories, your a good point. own marriage mm-hmm. and your own family, people respond to that. And they're, they're going to be at different levels. You know, that, I think that's a, the beauty of uh, the Pope saying we walk with individuals because they're walking at different paces. You know the, uh, the the couple that's pre- uh, preparing for marriage. They're running towards the you know towards the altar. They, they don't have time. You know, they talk about busyness. They don't have time to listen. You're talking about mystery. I don't want to hear about mystery. I want to get to the altar. I want to set my life together. I want to. Do, I don't want to hear about this mystery thing. I don't want to hear. And yet, you've got to plant the seed. There, you've got to plant the seed. Whereas, once they're married. They've got to be reminded constantly of the uh, of the tremendous. And then as they, you know, as um, as I have been privileged to, you know, watch those 25, 50 years, 65, 70 years uh, wow. in marriage, you you see the richness uh, of, of everything basically coming together. So. Uh, so, you know, I think, sir, you're right. You know, you've, you've got to find how to how to touch them walking at different paces as you kind of walk with them. But Will, you're you're in the seminary. What are you going to? Uh, well, how, how are you going to take this work, and how are you going to incorporate it into your work in the seminary? Sure. Well, I mean, I think Father Luke and I have already begun talking about. Uh, I mean, so I, I help Father Luke um, with the uh, the coordination of the formation uh, of the seminarians, and I mean, this is. Sarah talked about accompaniment. I mean, these mm-hmm. future semin. I mean, these seminaries, these future priests, pastors. I mean, this. Uh, they're going to need to know how to to sit down with families, how to reach out with them and love at the different stages of their journey, just as you were saying. Um, so, I mean, I think there's there's plenty of room for this to to be incorporated into the formation of the seminarians. I believe it's chapter eight, which is the one that uh, kind of draws a lot of the interest. Yes, sure. Which uh, talks in terms of the um, the marriages that have been broken, second marriages mm-hmm, that are mm-hmm. basically uh, encountered. Uh, what was your uh, estimation of, um, uh, of Pope Francis's um, uh, sense in, in in that that chapter and in, in 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 dealing, if you want, with uh, w- with those pastoral situations? I would say that I'm struck by the fact that he keeps on talking about the accompaniment and pastoral dialogue. He's assuming that. Pastors are going to be entering into people's real life situations and talking to them and walking with them. And so it puts a lot of, I think, a high expectation on our priests. But I think it's a really beautiful approach to say, let's get to know people and get to know their situations. And then we'll talk about what comes next. But first, we need to know people and we need to engage with them in their real lives. And I was struck by he he often said, People often want, or maybe pastors often want, something that's black and white, uh, a pastoral uh, program that leaves no room for confusion, which I think sometimes that's how I am, actually. So it was very challenging that, no, you have to meet people where they are. You have to, just as Sarah's saying, you have to walk with them. You have to accompany them. So I, I found Chapter 8 challenging for me personally, like in a good way, you know, calling me forth to, to not just judge by appearances, not just to throw church teaching at someone and walk away, as I think he said, someplace, but to actually engage with them, to actually walk with them. So. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, a person who's involved in a second marriage without an annulment sure. of my first marriage. So I, you know, I, I come to the, the two of you and I want to know, well, hey, what do I do? Pope Francis, you know, kind of is reaching out to me. What, what do I do? How do, you, how do you, how do you help me? Sarah, how do you help me? Sarah, help me. (laughs) Well, I think almost in any situation like that, the first thing I would do is say, come in. Let's sit down and talk. Let me get to know you. Let me get to know your story. Let's build a level of trust. Because no answer that I can give you in five minutes is going to be either helpful or truthful or can't be both. I, I would need to spend time with you and get to know your situation before we can even begin to start laying out. So where is God calling you? right now? How is he, what's the next step for you in your search for holiness? And, you know, fortunately, there's always, I'm not the final authority on this. So I would always be in a position of saying, and ultimately, come talk to our pastor, who is the one who's in charge of your discernment here, and who can walk with you on this even more closely. What what the Pope is saying, though, is that there's hope. There's always hope. Yeah, there's there's always hope. There's always hope for further integration into the community, 
um, where all I think that's he said this multiple times, the perfect family doesn't fall from heaven. And so mm-hmm. there's always hope to grow. It's a lifelong project of love. And we can affirm the good things that are going on. And did he tell us at the beginning of the book to pay careful attention to chapter eight and that will be challenged in chapter eight? Are we all challenged to, based on, on on your reading of chapter eight? Are we are we all to see the same challenge um, from chapter eight or are we to see slightly different nuanced challenges of chapter eight. He, he actually s- said that the the one that most of the readers will run to will be chapter eight. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and, be cha- and, and because and, that's a, the controversial problem. You know? Ah, okay. But, but he, he, his, his encouragement was read those other chapters, which tell you about the basis, mm-hmm. foundational basis of, uh, of marriage. So that's, you know, that uh, don't run to, to eight right away and right. just take, take a look at it, take right. a look at those others. The other aspect is I would uh, kind of offer is many people who will be inspired you know, to take a look, especially those in the second second marriage, to take a look at the annulment process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have a tremendous annulment staff here at the um, uh, tribunal here at uh, the archdiocese, and they're more than glad to, to to help and walk with people to be able to make the correctives that uh, that may be needed and, and may be at sure, the disposal. Yeah. So don't just you know jump over you know the the, the processes of the uh, of the church, but basically embrace them until we can see whether or not you know that that can't be of service uh, to you. And I think t- too many people kind of just run out outside of that rather than kind of seeing whether the church can help or not. Right. Yeah. I think that's a lot of wisdom, Archbishop, just to, if, well, if, so thank you for saying yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. Bishop, I <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think that's, that's part of it. And I, I, I think even the, the Catholic community, we, um, you know, the lay Catholics can help their, their neighbors and friends to kind of say, Hey, have you talked to somebody about, you know, the possibility uh, of annulment? Have you, have you sat down and you go on the staff, you know, so the, to, to see whether or not have you, you filed basically papers to let the, the tribunal make a determination of whether or not they can do things for you. So uh, it's there. It's mm-hmm. there to help make the cor- to the correctives. And you don't want to jump over that when that it can really be a source of reconciling reconciling us and, and bringing people together. This is another one of those topics we could spend hours on. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we have to take our final break. Uh, we are going to go to break then we're going to come back and we'll have our closing prayer you're listening to living our faith here on relevant radio a trip to the hospital can be an intimidating event for patients and their families oftentimes a hospitalization will require rehabilitation after discharge the way this transition is handled is critical to the health and well-being of your loved one St. Camillus Rehabilitation maintains a standard of excellence, and our record proves it. 99% of our discharged patients return to functioning at the same level or higher prior to their rehab stay, and the average length of stay is just 24 days. Satisfied patients is evidenced by our post-discharge satisfaction surveys, which average a 4.5 out of a 5-star rating. Hear about the St. Camillus mission from nursing administrator Sandra Dugan. We strive to practice the St. Camillus mission by providing holistic care, and this can be assured through physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual care needs that we will meet in our continuum of care and in all phases of life. For more information regarding St. Camillus Rehabilitation, go to relevantradio.com keyword rehab. Our final recommendation on this show is go out and read The Joy of Love by Pope Francis. We'd like to thank our guests, Sarah Larson and Will Hudson, and we'll close the show as we always do with prayer, Your Excellency. Sure, and l- let's use the Jubilee a Year of Mercy prayer uh, since it's Pope Francis who did the joy of love. Let's um, uh, close with his prayer, and this is the Jubilee Year of Mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, you have, have taught, taught us to be merciful like, like, like the, the Heavenly Father. Father. You have, have told, told us that whoever sees you sees him. him. Let Let the the church church be your your visible visible face in the world. world. Send Send your your spirit so that the jubilee of mercy may be a year of grace from the Lord. And And your church, with with renewed enthusiasm, bring good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to captives and the oppressed, and restore sight to the blind. We ask this through the intercession of Mary, Mother of Mercy, you who live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. And may the blessings of Almighty God be upon you, the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us today and have a wonderful weekend. And let's all be transformed by the Spirit. This has been Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki and co-host Bob Bennis. Join us again next week for the latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee.